Good evening and welcome to day five of the second annual iHeart Pluto Festival. My name is Kevin Schindler and I'm the Historical Observatory and I am pleased to serve as your host throughout the week. Um, I'm sitting tonight in a really small room. Um, it's four feet by eight feet. This was a dark room at one time and this is where Clyde Tomba um, processed the photographic glass plates including the Pluto discovery plates back in 1930. Um, it's not used for that anymore. Um, it's mostly storage, but you can still see some old Kodak film boxes and stuff like that in here. Um, so neat, neat heritage that we're sharing this week as we celebrate the scientific and cultural heritage of Pluto. Um, we, we still have a couple days left. We've had astronauts, artists, scientists um, celebrating Pluto. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I, I say Pluto, but we also mean the Pluto system, which we're gonna celebrate tonight. Um, in addition to these regular nightly programs, we also have some ongoing uh, presentations. Um, we've got our friends down at Karma Sushi Bar Grill in downtown Flagstaff. They brought back their wildly popular Pluto roll for the festival this year. Um, we also have um, an ongoing art display by the International Association of Astronomical Artists. And you can go to the iHeart Pluto website to check that out. And in fact, the program right after this, we're gonna have several of those artists here talking about how Pluto has been depicted through the years in art. And then we also have our friends with the local, the local uh, radio club who's operating out, out, of our, uh, out of our parking lot, making contacts around the world, talking to people about Pluto. So there's a lot of really great stuff going on. I also will mention that our gift shop at Lowell, um, even though we're not open um, for the most part right now, um, we do have our online gift shop, and we have a lot of Pluto theme items, such as these Pluto globes by local artist George Averbeck. This one showing the, the heart of Pluto, and then this one kind of showing the whole globe. So there's a lot of neat stuff going on um, this week with Pluto. Tonight's program, we're gonna we're gonna not talk about Pluto itself, but we're gonna talk about something else, and that's its largest moon, Charon, which was discovered off of photographic glass plates just four miles from where Pluto was discovered. It was uh, these photographic glass plates were taken at the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station. I'm here in Flagstaff. And uh, the guy who made that discovery, his name is Jim Christie. And there's a, there's a fun story about the discovery and um, the naming of, of Sharon. And so we don't have Jim and Charlene in person here tonight, but they were kind enough to record a short welcome. Um, so we're going to play that uh, first of all. So um, here comes Jim and Charlene Christie. I started work at the Naval Observatory in Flagstaff in 1962. And uh, that was before the 61 inch was finished. It was under construction then. I worked on the 40 inch uh, many nights. And then I worked on the 61 inch uh, for about nine years. And uh, about a thousand nights or more. And uh, did a lot of observing, enjoyed the night work. And I was transferred to Washington, D.C. Naval Observatory. And uh, in that tenure period, I uh, discovered the Moon of Pluto, Charon, in 1978. Uh, this was uh, an, a breakthrough in the knowledge of Pluto uh, because up to that time it was difficult to know anything about Pluto. But with the discovery of the moon, uh, an orbital period was established and the mass of Pluto and Charon was established. So it was a big breakthrough. 
that have actually greatly helped the financing of New Horizons' mission to Pluto. So it was uh, an amazing event with a lot of, lot of follow-up. In 1978, right after I discovered it, a couple days later, I uh, was joking with Charlene that I could name the name Pluto, or name the moon of Pluto, <laughs> and uh, I suggested I could call it Oz to be a nice name for kids, but I, I knew it had to come from Greek or Roman mythology. And then I suggest, well, I could name it after you. Uh, Charlene's family calls her Char, and so do I. Uh, and I said, well, I could name it Char on. I had it on to make it an object. Now, that was just really a joke. And I didn't take it too seriously until a couple days later, uh, in the middle of the night, I got up and I looked, I decided I have to decide whether I could name it Charon. And I did the ridiculous thing of looking in a dictionary and I found C-H-A-R-O-N in the dictionary. Uh, the boatman who wrote the Dead Souls Cross the River Styx into the domain of Pluto. So my joke took, turned into a name for Charlene. Yeah, Jim called me at work at the time of his discovery and told me that he had just made a discovery. And so uh, it wasn't too long after that, they had the uh, press conference of the Naval Observatory that I went to. I was working at the time at the University of Maryland. And so anyway, he uh, uh, told me that he would, he would name the moon after me. And so I was quite honored with that. And I always say a lot of husbands promise their wives moon, but mine delivered. So I wanted to thank everybody for including us in this I Heart Pluto event. Jim and Char for that lovely story. Um, Jim and Char live here in Flagstaff. They're retired here, and it's really a pleasure to be able to have them involved with the iHeart Pluto Festival. Now, when you're listening to that, if you're not familiar with um, the story of Pluto and of Sharon's discovery, um, you might wonder, did he say Naval Observatory? Why is there a Naval Observatory at 7,000 feet here in Flagstaff? Um, and there's a good story behind it. And, and the observatory does so much more than just um, the discovery of Sharon. I and mean, that was a, a big discovery, but there's a lot of other research um, that has gone on there and continues to go on. And so now we're gonna play a video um, featuring several of our, uh, the astronomers at the Naval Observatory, and we'll learn a little bit more about what happens there. And, and also we'll talk about the discovery of Sharon. Hi, welcome to the Naval Observatory. I'm astronomer Mary Sue Carter, and I'm in the Earth Orientation Department. But today, my colleagues and I are happy to welcome you on behalf of the I Heart Pluto Festival. So we'll be giving you a little history of the observatory, showing you around the Flagstaff Station, and of course, talking to you about the discovery of Pluto's largest moon, Charon. We're so glad you could be here, and we hope you enjoy your visit.
On December 6, 1830, Lieutenant Lewis M. Goldsboro founded the Depot of Charts and Instruments. Goldsboro recognized the need that sailors had for a central location where they could have their ship's chronometers rated, as well as obtain the astronomical information that they would need for celestial navigation across the seas. In 1844, a permanent structure for the Naval Observatory was built in an area of town called Foggy Bottom. It was just north of the Lincoln Memorial and just east of the White House. In 1873, the Great Equatorial, a 26-inch refracting telescope made by Alvin Clark and Sons, was installed at a cost of $50,000. It was the largest refractor in the world and would keep that title for the next 10 years. In August of 1877, Naval Observatory astronomer Asa Paul and his assistant George Anderson discovered the two tiny moons of Mars. The planet Mars had long been suspected of having moons, and Aesop Hall was particularly looking for them. He designed a program to search for those moons because the Earth and Mars were, were close together in their orbits around the Sun, and the chance of finding the moons was at its greatest in the summer. This remarkable discovery assured Aesop Hall, the United States Naval Observatory, and the 26-inch Great Equatorial, a place in the history books. In 1893, the observatory abandoned its previous location in Foggy Bottom and moved to northwest Washington, D.C. in an area called Pretty Prospect. It was there the astronomers hoped to escape the city lights and traffic that had made observations nearly impossible in Foggy Bottom. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for the city to encroach on the Naval Observatory again, and a dark sky site needed to be located. The majority of the mostly civilian staff of the Naval Observatory still work at the main observatory in Washington, D.C., where we also host the Vice President of the United States on our grounds. However, a few of us are lucky enough to call the Flagstaff Station our home. The observatory is located just west of Flagstaff, off of Route 66 on West Naval Observatory Road. Due to staffing restrictions, the observatory is not open to the public, but you can visit every year during the Festival of Science in the fall. I'm Mike DiVittorio. I'm currently the director of the Flagstaff Station of the U.S. Naval Observatory. The station was founded in 1955 um, as a reaction to the need for a dark sky site for USNO. When you're sighting a telescope, an astronomical telescope, the three things you're looking for are a high site, a dark site, and a dry site. Washington, D.C. is none of those, and so in, in, at that time, the first telescope was moved from Washington, D.C. to the Flagstaff Station. This dome houses the Ritchie one meter or 40 inch telescope, and we're going to go in and take a look at that telescope. This is the one meter or 40 inch Ritchie telescope. It was not only designed by George Ritchie, but it was actually built by George Ritchie in the 1930s in Washington, D.C. By the 50s, it became obvious that that uh, USNO needed a dark sky site, so the Flagstaff Station was established, and this telescope was moved from Washington, D.C. to Flagstaff. It's been modified a few times in terms, of, in terms of motors and encoders and cameras, but it's still basically the telescope he built. What's interesting about it is it's considered the first large Ritchie Cratian telescope, or RC. This is a slightly different optical design that George Ritchie and uh, Henri Chrétien designed in the early part of the last century, and 
It took a while to catch on, but it's a better optical design. It gives you a wider field of view. And now any big telescope for the most part is an RC. The Hubble is an RC. The Keck telescopes are RCs, for example. This telescope is used most clear nights with a CCD camera, a charge couple device that is cooled by liquid nitrogen. And it mostly does photometry or colors and magnitudes of stars. Located just steps from the 40-inch telescope is our machine shop. It's here that our machinists and engineers create many of the high-tech instruments that are used on our telescopes. They can create, build, repair, all the instrumentation that's used here in Flagstaff. Building on the success of the 40-inch program in the early 1960s, Construction began at the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station of the 61-inch telescope. This is the NOF 61-inch telescope, or 1.55 meter. It was built in the early 1960s. It was built specifically to do in-frame astrometry, that is the angular measurement, the separation of two objects or more in that field of view. Um, and it was done particularly for the parallax program, that is a, a, a technique to measure the distance to relatively nearby stars. What's special about this telescope is that uh, the secondary is flat, and that, uh, that means that this telescope is very insensitive to, to misalignments, including, including focus errors, that is the motion of the secondary toward the primary or away from the primary due to temperature changes. And that produces a very stable aberration field that allows you to do this very high precision astrometry um, much better than if this was either a classical Cassegrain or a Ritchie Cretean telescope where the secondary was curved. And that optical design is what allowed NOFs to do the very, very high precision astrometry and therefore parallax measurements. The discovery of Sharon was made on the 61 inch Chi Strand telescope at the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station. This telescope is very unique. It's specifically made to measure the positions of stars with extremely high accuracy. And in fact, it's the best telescope for such measurements on the surface of the Earth. In 1978, astronomer Jim Christie was looking for a project to do in Washington, D.C. His supervisor, Bob Harrington, handed him some plates of the planet Pluto that had recently been taken with a 61-inch telescope. The orbit of Pluto was not well known because of its relatively recent discovery. Jim noticed that there was an elongation on some of the images, sometimes appearing in the right, sometimes appearing on the left, and soon realized that he was seeing a moon of Pluto. More images were taken with the 61 inch and the discovery was soon confirmed. Jim Christie was given the honor of naming the moon, which he called Charon, after his wife. With the half the diameter and an eighth of the mass of Pluto, Charon is a large moon. In fact, the very center of the two-body system is outside the surface of Pluto, making it a binary system. Today we know that Pluto actually has five moons, the other four discovered by space-based systems. The original discovery plate shows just how difficult a discovery this was. It's a very small bump. The image is very pixelated. Compared against space telescope imagery, it becomes very obvious to see what's going on. But at the time, it took quite the eye to be able to see this bump in Pluto, let alone go back and see that this bump moved around Pluto. 
Following the very exciting discovery of Charon, the astronomers at the Naval Observatory continued moving forward, and in the late 1990s, the 1.3 meter telescope was installed just across the parking lot from the great 61 inch. This is the 1.3 meter telescope at the Flagstaff Station. This was built in the late 1990s, and it's different than the rest of our telescopes in that it is a wide field telescope. Its optical design produces a very wide field, covers a big chunk of the sky. It doesn't have as, as good precision and accuracy as the other telescopes, but it gives you a big piece of the sky to look at it at once. We have an array camera that was built here on station that has six CCD chips in it, and you are viewing over one by one and a half degrees when you um, take an image with that camera. So that gobbles up a bunch of the sky and lets you do things that requires that versus a small piece of the sky with higher accuracy. The images taken with the 1.3 meter telescope are unique in that they are divided into six equal sections. The image is taken, the telescope moves slightly, and another image is taken. Then those two images are knit together by the computer to form one complete solid picture. Hey, this is Scott Dom. I'm the chief scientist at uh, Naval Observatory here in Flagstaff. And Behind me, over my shoulder, is the 1.8 meter telescope. That is our newest telescope that has been built over the last, oh, two and a half years. And it is being installed now. The telescope is a former Keck outrigger. That is, it was originally conceived to be incorporated into the Keck interferometer. Um, that project was canceled by NASA, and, and the telescope itself was provided to USNO. It is now being installed as a, as a single uh, telescope or single aperture telescope here in Flagstaff. At the moment, the telescope, uh, we plan to have it commissioned this summer. And after commissioning, we will have a new laser guide star adaptive optic system that is being designed and built for us by the University of Hawaii installed on the telescope. And we anticipate commissioning within a year. It'll be an exciting new development for USNL. The mission for the Laser Guide Star Adaptive Optic System will be uh, in support of the Washington Double Star Catalog. That is one of the mission sets that USNO is responsible for, um, monitoring binary stars uh, near and within the, the vicinity of the sun. Um, the Laser Guide Star Adaptive opt Optic Systems will give us a diffraction limited capability that is as if the telescope were above the Earth's atmosphere. With a 1.8 meter diameter aperture, the telescope will have a resolution of about a tenth of an arc second with the AO system, which is uh, unprecedented capability for and new capability for USNO. So the USNO 1.8 meter is bringing a new mission set to the observatory. Uh, that is the Laser Guide Star Adaptive Optic System, and the high angular resolution imaging capability for USNO. The imaging capabilities of our dark sky telescopes, the 40 inch, the 61 inch, the 1.3 meter, and the 1.8 meter give us the opportunity for many exciting new missions in the future. On behalf of my colleagues, I thank you for visiting with us today at the I Heart Pluto Festival. We hope you've enjoyed the little look into our past, present, and future work. We hope you all are safe and that someday in the future we can all get together and enjoy each other's company in person. Thanks.
Well, thanks for that great introduction to the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station, or NOFS as we call it. Um, there's really, really a great story with it, and we just kind of heard the highlights here. But if you want to ask your questions about the Naval Observatory um, or about Sharon's discovery, um, we have several astronomers from the Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station that are with us now. Um, so they're going to start popping up here. Um, as, and as they do, I'll introduce them. Um, Dr. Stephen Williams has worked with NOFS since 2019. His primary research focuses has been on massive stars, either studying individual stars or star systems, or collectively looking at massive stars as a whole in nearby galaxies. Dr. Fred Verba has been at the Naval Observatory for 45 years. He studied under astronomy and physics legends such as James Van Allen and Bart Bach. Um, he's worked in several areas, starting with protostar detection, young star evolution, gamma ray bursts, and most recently, brown dwarf physics. And Michael DiVittorio is the director of NOFS. Before that, he served as a telescope engineer for 20 years. Um, among his many things he's done in the past was spacecraft engineer and test director on the Hubble Space Telescope Program at Lockheed. And then Mary Sue Carter, whose primary work is studying polar motion and variations and the rotation of Earth using VLBI GPS observations collected at stations around the world. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, uh, Mary Sue, for heading up the video project um, to, to help us learn more about the Naval Observatory. So we're just going to kind of have an open discussion about the Naval Observatory. Um, we'll take questions from our guests. And otherwise, uh, we'll look forward to to hearing a little bit more about the Naval Observatory. Um, our, our friend uh, Jim Davies um, has written in a question asking if it was cold in the dome. And I'm not sure, Jim, if you're talking about uh, um, when Jim uh, photographing the place for Sharon or just in general, but I think it's the same answer. So I'll turn that over to one of you guys to comment on. Um, the dome is the, the inside of the dome is the same temperature as the outside of the dome in the middle of the, of the night. So if it's cold outside, it's cold in the dome. <laughs> so what's it, what's it been like working um, at the Naval Observatory during the um, COVID? What's your typical day been like? Okay, I'm gonna to have to start assigning you guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is Mike. Oh, Mike, why don't you take that since you're in charge? Um, right now we have typically between three or four people there during the day. Most everyone is teleworking. Our policy is is to uh, to do maximum telework to minimize obviously the spread of COVID. Fortunately, um, in this day and age, astronomers and Stephen and, and Fred Verba and Mary Sue can, can attest to this, can do an awful lot of their work from home with their computer. So that allows them to stay at home as long as computers and networks are working and do their, whether it's data analysis or whether it's planning of observations or whatnot. Now, those of us who are working on installing the 1.8 meter in the dome, you can't do that with telework. So there are a few of us that do come in every day and mainly work on that project and make sure that the telescopes are ready for use every night. Okay. Here's a question from Catherine Turrentine, one of our educators here at the observatory. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer, or NPOI, and what research you're doing with that? Who wants that one? They're really gonna get me in trouble because my husband is the director of the NPOI. <laughs> So you, you would think I would have included him in the movie, but uh, yeah, I just didn't. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Stephen, you wanna take that or? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about NPOI. Um, the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer is located on Anderson Mesa. So if you visit the Perkins or Hall telescopes, um, just over the fence, you'll see the structures and the telescopes themselves that make up NPOI. Uh, NPOI is an interferometer, and so you combine the light from two separate telescopes, which is unlike looking through the eyepiece of one telescope. And just like with the 61-inch, where you can make very fine 
precise measurements of the positions of stars, you can do the same, but with better resolution using endpoint. And at least for some of the scientific work that I do, studying binary stars, you can measure as two stars orbit around each other. Okay, let me, um, let me pass one to Fred here. Um, this is from Book Davies. What makes the 40 inch Ritchie different from the standard design Ritchie Crescent telescope? And Fred, Fred having trouble getting a sound on, so maybe somebody else take that. So until Fred shows up, um, so the classical Cassegrain, which was the the telescope that would have that used two powered or curved mirrors before that, had a paraboloid for a primary and and hyperboloid for a secondary, and it was. Richie and uh, Chrétien that figured out that if you change the secondary to a hyperboloid, I mean the primary to a hyperboloid, you would actually uh, zero out coma, which is one of the classical aberrations in telescopes, and you'd get a wider field with better performance. So um, that's what is different about a, a an RC versus a classical Cassegrain. And a lot of big telescopes were, were made as classical Cassegrains, even well after Richie and Cretien had demonstrated the RC. The Polymar 200 inch is a classical Cassegrain because by that time, they, people still weren't quite sure that this newfangled design worked. And so the 200 inches is a classical Cassegrain, not an RC. But after about that point, all of the large four meter telescopes that, that were around, built around the world in the 70s, those were all RCs, as were most any large telescope built today unless they're, they're specifically going for a wide field, then they add some extra optics. But if you're building a two, meter, a two mirror telescope today, um, you're probably gonna build an RC. And the 40, the 40 inch is really a historic telescope. Um, is there anything special you need to do to take care of it? I mean, you're using it pretty regularly. Um, have you had to upgrade it much through the years or? The, the main upgrades have been to the, uh, the encoders that are devices that you mount on the telescope to tell you where you're pointing very accurately. And of course, the cameras that hang off the back. Originally, um, not just the 40 inch, but the 61 inch also, they were built, designed and built to use photographic plates. And, um, but now, of course, we use all uh, electronic cameras of some kind, whether they're CCDs or CMOS or or, or INSPE infrared detectors. So it's mainly that uh, uh, the encoders and the cameras. And it's always, it's always a fine line between doing research with an old instrument, but still preserving its, its, its historic nature. I'm sure you know that at, at Lowell, Kevin. Right. Okay, here's another one. Um, what's, it, what's it like working at um, doing research for a government agency like the Naval Observatory, what kind of challenges do you have and what what are the benefits of working that sort of setup? Hi, Steve Williams. Yeah, um, I, I'm a relatively recent hire, as you mentioned in my bio. And one of the things that really attracted me to working with the Navy and the government in particular was the hands-on aspect of being with the telescopes, you know, make sure the telescope is working. And as long as it's working and we're not asking you to do some particular project, well, um, you use that telescope. So <laughs> there's an unbelievable amount of time available to me to do my own research. And that's one of the fantastic things uh, about working for the Naval Observatory. And of course, specifically at NOS, the hands-on as well. It's just wonderful. I think this is a good question to pass around to everybody. So, um, Fred, are you online? Um, we'll just go to Mike until we'll see if Fred comes on. But, Mike, why don't you give us your perspective on that? So, it, it certainly is different than working at um, other observatories in that there is, there is a military mission component um, that you don't usually run into elsewhere. but what we try to do is is projects that are uh, 
uh, sort of serendipitous that have both both an interest that that the Navy has in the project, but also, as Stephen mentioned, that that also has, is good science, and that's the real goal: is to do things. Um, for example, if you if you if you make a star catalog that the Navy wants to use, there's an opportunity to mine that catalog for 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 good science. So we try to do um, things that are are meet both both that mission, but also provide the opportunity to do good science. Mm -hmm. Mary Sue. Um, for me, um, it's great. I, I'm not always looking for funding. I'm not spending a lot of time trying to write um, proposals to get funding. But it can also be um, difficult because the Navy has certain interests, and that's what they're interested in. So I'm a radio astronomer, and um, my work is used to determine the orbit of our planet. If I find something interesting, an interesting radio source or something, um, I might not, the Navy might not necessarily care. And so I might have to hand that off to another astronomer to do further research on that because I need to still do my job. So um, as long as the mission is done, it's great. We get to do what we want, but you have to get that mission done first. And let's talk some more about the challenges, <laughs> you know, the financial challenges as the, as the um, budget changes. I mean, that's an issue for all observatories and science centers, but being a government agency, um, that's a little bit more unique. Uh, maybe talk about that a little bit, Mike. Whoops. So uh, I see Fred's back on, that's good. Um, okay. So as Mary Sue mentioned, we don't go out really for outside money like uh, say soft money from NASA or NSF or things like that. Very rarely do we do that. So we have to kind of live within the budget we have which is, is different um, and you have to obviously plan very carefully to use that money wisely. And what, what's harder to do for us in general is to hire people. That is just a very complicated, long drawn out process, which is unfortunate. And we, so we often find ourselves, um, we have spots or slots for people, but the system is rather burdensome. So they're often vacant and that actually makes it, makes it very difficult. But uh, we're hoping that in the near future we'll be we'll be filling some of those slots and and um, we'll be in better shape. Okay. Well, it looks like we have Fred back on the line, and so Fred, since you're the senior statesman here, maybe you can talk about um, you know the maybe the biggest or coolest thing you've seen since you've been at the observatory in the last forty five years. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm online. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so I've my I've spent my entire professional career at uh, the observatory, and I think the rather than just saying about one thing, it is just amazing how astronomy has changed um, in the in those years. And in it's, I think with most sciences, it's mostly technology driven, but I think you can go back to um, what what Jim was talking about and Mary Sue uh, back in the in the 70s when we were taking photographic plates of, of Pluto, we were just trying to understand better the the orbit of it. It had only been discovered you know 35 years before or whatever. So uh, you know in you know in these days we send space probes out out past the the planet and the moon, which is just you know orders of magnitude more complex and and um, interesting than, than just trying to get a rough idea of, of the orbit and thus the mass, et cetera, of, of the planet. Um, and the, the 61 inches, as people mentioned, were was basically used for uh, parallax observations when I came on board. And one, one of the reasons I, I was very interested in coming here was uh, we were still trying to determine what the bottom of the main sequence of, of, of stars was just, you know, Nobody knew exactly, um, um, you know, how, how faint stars went, uh, how, how low mass they went. Um, things like blue stragglers, various different kinds of uh, stars weren't even known yet. So it's very, 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 very fundamental astronomy today. Stuff that you would see possibly in a advanced textbook is, you know, stuff that's encompassed my career. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a completely different world today, and one which is. Um, I would say considerably advanced over what we did 40 years ago. Sure. 
Okay, here's a question from our friend Bob Larkin. Hi, Bob. Uh, maybe this is a good one for you, Mike. Um, what's the ratio of observations that support USNO's navigation GPS mission and pure science endeavors? Does the work at NOFS lean more to science? Well, you know, I'm going to throw that one back toward Fred um, okay. because it's it's the question is what really falls into what category and what falls into both categories. Uh, historically, for example, Fred, I think you'll agree the Parallax program was a mission program. That is, the Navy had an interest in knowing the distance to these nearby stars. And over time, that might have evolved where that becomes more science. So, Fred, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's a difficult thing to say uh, at any one moment. Uh, the, clearly, the, um, the selling of the telescope um, was based on, on mission objectives at the time, um, but it was pretty much used for, for science um, from the get-go in, in determining the, the main sequence and all that. Um, but there is there is this this very delicate balance between you know what is science and what is mission. Uh, a lot of times you just they're, they're just one and the same. I mean, if you advance a, a science project, you're advancing the mission and, and vice versa. We've um, we, we do a lot of work with understanding the fundamental positions of stars, whether they're the bright ones for navigation or uh, faint ones, just understanding where, how we're moving through the galaxy. Um, and they, you know, if you're really trying to understand the, what we call the celestial reference frame, you really need to know something about all of that. Okay. Here's a, here's a good one. Um, what's your interaction with the, with the new space force? Is there any collaborative work that you'll be doing with them? I'll start with that, but everyone can, can, can add their two cents. At this point, we um, really haven't been working with the Space Force. Uh, historically, we have worked with the Air Force on different things, especially star catalogs, and that may continue. But it, I think a, a lot of people are really waiting to see how the, the Space Force plays out um, in, the long, in the long term. Um, there are things that the Air Force obviously is responsible for in space and things that the Naval Observatory is. There's some overlap there, but um, we try not to step on each other's toes if possible. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Okay. Let's talk, since we're talking about collaboration, what other organizations do you collaborate with? Well, I'll start, but then I, then everyone else, I think, will get to add in. Obviously, probably our biggest collaboration in Flagstaff is with Lowell Observatory and the Naval Research Lab at the NPOI, which has been going on since the um, since the '90s. So that's a that's a three group partnership to that has built and operates that that um, interferometer. But why don't the rest of the folks talk about collaborations they are they are participating in? I can take over a little bit on that one. Uh, so this is Fred. Um, so uh, from my group standpoint, our biggest collaboration is with the University of Hawaii. We're running a multi-year um, Northern Hemisphere Sky Survey in the near infrared uh, using the UCIR telescope. Uh, and that's a collaboration between us, University of Hawaii, uh, Enbro University, and Cambridge University. Uh, so that is a project which probably has another two or three years to go. We're doing kind of a, a, a deep version of what uh, the, the two mass um, astronomical sky survey did back about 20, 22 years ago. Um, but we're going quite a bit, quite a bit fainter. That's that's my main outside collaboration. So for me, uh, my work uh, doing radio astronomy and um, determining the orbit, the orbit of the Earth. So we have to have telescopes all over the Earth. So my department is highly collaborative. We have telescopes on every continent, including Antarctica, and we have GPS, geodetic uh, GPS on in probably every country in the world. So we are collaborating all the time to to send and receive data. 
And uh, my, my collaborations, um, I'm actually part of Fred's group. And so the collaborations with Hawaii are one thing, but also with uh, some of my former colleagues. And a lot of those are actually in Greece uh, at the University of Crete and the National Observatory of Athens. Also some collaboration, and these are all pretty much massive star work or binary star work. Also collaborations where I went and got my PhD at Georgia State in Atlanta. And uh, I keep in, in touch with everyone and we've published a few papers and we've got a few cooking right now, so. Okay, great. We have about five minutes left, so um, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, here's one from the Pluto Diaries, who's been tuning in every night, thank you. Um, what kinds of things did the Navy do with that information about the distance between the nearby stars? Fred Verba. Okay, I guess that's one for me. Um, you bet. Right. So uh, it, it all goes back to um, knowing what's, uh, from the Navy standpoint, knowing what's up in the sky, what is uh, what the motions are, um, and, and simply knowing everything that's in the sky. You can imagine that um, for, uh, you don't want to be shooting down some, you know, asteroid that's moving through, through, um, the area around the Earth, or some, you know, fairly fast-moving star out there, uh, but but primarily, um, you know, you just this idea of the celestial reference frame. We just want to know the positions, brightnesses, and motions of of, of everything that's out there. It's it's basically what what the military would call situational awareness, and of course, embedded in that is just a whole lot of science. Okay, another question from Bob Larkin. Uh, do you have favorite items that were fabricated on site at the station, such as the CCD camera in the video? So for me, certainly the array camera, which was um, um, built by uh, Fred Harris, our, our currently now retired electronics engineer. He designed and built the electronics and our machine shop built the built part of the doer that actually holds those six chips in place. And when that was, when that camera was first built, um, array cameras were fairly new and that was, a, that was a, a fairly big deal. Um, so that's, that's my favorite object that was built at, at Flagstaff station. Anybody else? Okay. Let's, let's take one last question. And this is, this kind of question is always a great one to end on. Um, from Lauren L. Any advice for students interested in working with or for USNO? Um, so student-wise, there's a program called SEEP, which Mary Sue, it, what, it is what? Uh, Science and Engineering Apprenticeship Program. It's, yes. It's, it's um, run by the Office of Naval Research. And that, um, that funds both um, high school and um, college um, internships. Obviously, right now, this year will probably may end up being a virtual one, but usually every year we have one or two students that come and work at um, the Naval Observatory and are, and are paid through the Office of Naval Research. And typically they are doing um, either some combination of, of basic scientific research or some engineering work on instruments um, at the observatory. Okay. Well, that's great. And it's certainly something we want to be getting students interested and in making opportunities for them, um, the next generation scientists, um, more critical now than ever probably um, to promote that. So thanks all you for joining us. It looks like it's about time to go. Um, so Stephen, Fred, Michael, and Mary Sue, um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for Jim and Charlene Christie um, for telling us about the Naval Observatory um, discovery of Sharon and some of the stuff that goes on here in Flagstaff. Um, and we appreciate you coming on and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, if you stay tuned, we'll be um, hearing from the International Association of Space Artists in just a few minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for including the Naval Observatory in your program. You're welcome.